How's it going, everyone? It's Mostrino here. If you're just interested in seeing how to actually do spectral stretching and you're not really interested in the motivations or concept behind it, I've put timestamps in the description so you can skip to that part now if you want. For those of you who are interested in the concept, though, don't go anywhere because that is what I'm going to talk about right now. So first of all, let me just start off with saying that it's pretty common knowledge that stretching usually hurts the quality when you try and stretch full tracks. I actually made a whole video about this last year, and mix contest winners have mentioned this in the how to mix contest videos that I've put out so far. But the thing is, stretching algorithms, they can work really nicely on instruments or vocals, but they're not as well suited for full tracks. And a pretty reasonable thing to ask would be, well, why is this the case? And to answer that, let's take a second to look at how these algorithms actually work. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you guys are either using Ableton or FL Studio, though most, if not all of what I say, is going to apply to time stretching and other DAWs. But I'm just going to focus on those two for now. So if we take a look here at Ableton's manual, most of it talks about like when you would want to use the different warp modes, but there isn't really a whole lot that explains what's actually going on under the hood, except for this part here that reads, the warp modes are different varieties of granular resynthesis techniques. Granular resynthesis achieves time compression and expansion by repeating and skipping over parts of the sample, the grains. The warp modes differ in the selection of grains as well as in the details of overlapping and crossfading between grains. So basically, it splits the audio into a bunch of really small parts, and when you want to speed it up, it'll skip over some of the parts to make the audio go faster. And when you want to slow it down, it'll repeat the parts to make the audio go more slowly. So that's why when you stretch a track, you can sometimes get like double kicks when slowing it down or disappearing kicks when speeding it up, just because it's either repeating or skipping over that part of the song, right? Like it might repeat the kick and then you get the double kick, or it'll skip over it and then it kind of disappears. Okay, so that's Ableton. How about FL? Well, if we take a look at FL's manual, it would look like they don't really say anything about how the stretching actually works, more so applications kind of like the Ableton manual. But what you can see here is that they do say that they use Z-Plane's Elastic Pro 3 for their time stretching algorithms. And actually, this is what Ableton uses too. In Z-Plane's page, Ableton is actually the first one listed in their uh, partners list. And it turns out that it was actually the people at Z-Plane who made the complex and complex pro algorithms for Ableton. So if you're using Ableton, all of the stuff that I say about Z-Plane is going to apply to you guys too. I don't actually know who made the other warp modes in Ableton, but from what I've heard from like Rocket Man, if you're stretching tracks, you're going to want to use the complex or complex pro modes anyway. So the other modes aren't really going to matter for the sake of this video. So we can just focus on the Z-Plane stuff right now. So this is pretty big news because it tells us that FL stretch modes are going to use the same granular resynthesis techniques that Ableton's complex warp modes use. In fact, Z-Plane has actually done an excellent job of documenting their time stretching technology. If you want to see their documentation on the Elastic Pro 3, I'll link it in the description. It includes some pretty interesting stuff on like dynamic pitching and formant shifting, but I'm not really going to focus on those things for this video. Instead, I want to take a look at a related, and by the way, also publicly available resource. This is a textbook called Spectral Audio Signal Processing, written by a former Stanford University professor, and I'll also link it in the description. Specifically, I want to focus on this one section on spectral modeling synthesis. If we take a look at this first part, this is pretty related to stuff like the Fourier series. In fact, there's actually a Fourier convergence theorem that basically says that this equation is only true if the function is periodic and piecewise continuous, which is why the periodic shows up here. Also, if you're wondering about where the piecewise continuous part went, that's kind of a given for the sound wave to like exist. So that's that's why periodic shows up is basically that. And this second aperiodic part here kind of reflects the fact that you can't really remake 
uh, aperiodic sounds using just sine waves at harmonics of a fundamental, you're also going to need sine waves at other frequencies to fully remake the sound. So that's why it says it's going to be at potentially all frequencies in the range of human hearing. Also, something that is pretty important to notice is that the amplitude here isn't a constant. It's actually a function of time because as you know, for, for a track, each frequency isn't going to be at a constant amplitude all the time. Sometimes it's going to get louder, sometimes it's going to get quieter. So to be able to remake that sound, you're of course going to need to incorporate that in the formula here. So as the textbook mentions, this works really nicely for vowel sounds and for some instruments. And they also mention that it is actually the foundation for additive synthesis, which is pretty interesting if you didn't know it already. However, as they mentioned right below here, it doesn't really work for noise. And I could kind of describe it, but I feel like it would be easier to explain if we hop into the DAW. All right, so we're in the DAW here, and here I've got two sounds. The first one is just like a vocal ooh sound. And then here we've got a vocal breath. And also, if you're wondering where I got these sounds, these are both actually stock FL. You can get them in this, you can see them in this little miscellaneous folder here in the stock samples. So to explain why the sinusoidal model works for this vocal, but not really for the breath, let me go ahead and pull up this free Melda plugin and analyzer here. So let's take a look at the spectrum for both of these sounds. Let's start off with the vocal. So if we take a look here, we can see that there's some pretty clear resonances, right? It's picking up one at C5, another one at C6, another one at G6. And of course, there's some other, you know, frequencies happening down here. This is an aperiodic uh, signal after all. But if you can model these resonances up here, you're most of the way there. And then afterwards, you only really have a few to worry about. And these are pretty quiet as well. Notice that they're at like negative 50 dB, in some cases even lower, in some cases a little bit higher, but nothing compared to these resonances up here. Now, let's take a look at how the breath looks on the spectrum. So if we take a look at this, you can see that there's activity on basically the whole frequency spectrum. You would need thousands of sine waves to recreate this, and there aren't really any clear resonances. You can see that the plugin's trying to pick these up, but really it's just the whole thing is filled out. Whereas again, with the vocal up here, even though we do get some noise, look at how much quieter and more subdued it is, and you still get a lot of empty gaps. In fact, in this case, we basically have nothing below maybe 150 hertz going on here. So if you approach this with a sinusoidal model, you can obviously focus on the resonances here, and you'll only need maybe a 1,000 to 2,000 uh, sine waves to cover the rest. Whereas with this, basically everything from at least 100 hertz all the way to 20K is covered. You would need 20,000 sine waves to remake this, which is obviously very unreasonable which is why the textbook describes sinusoidal models as being relatively expensive for noise. And I honestly feel like relatively is, is pretty generous here. But either way, it's, it's much more unreasonable to try and remake noise with this model than it is to remake, you know, vowel sounds or, or certain instruments. That's why in Ableton, for example, you have the texture mode specifically designed for these sounds versus the tones mode or FL's E3 mono, which take that kind of sinusoidal approach. Then the last one that's mentioned in this section of the textbook here are transients. Like noise, these require a ton of sine waves to accurately remake, so it's not really a good idea to approach them with the same model. But I guess you might be wondering, why don't we just lump transients in with noise? Well, one difference, as they mention here, is that you normally want transients to be preserved when you're stretching. Uh, this goes back into the double kick, disappearing kick thing that I was mentioning earlier. Usually, transients are the thing that are the most hurt by stretching because it's really important to have a clear and punchy transient 
when you're working with a track and you definitely don't want to have that hurt when you're stretching it. So that's why you have something like Ableton's Beats mode or one of FL's special slice modes that focus specifically on transients. Also, just as a kind of an aside here, the textbook also makes a mention right below this about spectral weightings, which are kind of like what Z-Plane uses in order for you to be able to control the formats of a sound while stretching it. So that's some pretty interesting stuff as well, though I'm not really gonna focus on it for this video. But anyways, now it should be really clear why stretch modes just don't work nearly as well on tracks as they do for vocals or instruments, right? Because we have one model that's really good at capturing tones, another that's really good at capturing noise, and a third that's really good at capturing transients. So if you have a sound that only has one of these, the stretching algorithm, at least with moderate settings, it'll do a good job. But the tracks that we want to stretch have all three of these, so you basically always have to sacrifice at least one to be able to have the others. That is where this idea of spectral stretching that I had was born. What I wanted to figure out was what if there was a way to split the audio so that you only need to stretch the tonal part. That way, you can just leave the noise and transients on resample. Well, a few months ago, I found a way to do just that. Well, kinda. Let's take a look at it. The secret here is this plugin, Spectral Gate by Andrew Riemann. This plugin is completely free, by the way, and open source too. I'll link to it in the description. Let's take a look at how this plugin works. It's pretty simple. There's really only three sliders, a button here, a drop down here, and settings here so that you can change the Fast Fourier transform style to the phase vocoder, but we're not going to do that, so don't worry about that. Let's just talk about how these sliders work. So basically, what this plugin does is it looks at each individual frequency in your audio. And it's kind of like a giant if-then statement. First of all, it asks for each frequency if it's above or below this cutoff amplitude. And at these settings, what it would do is, if it's above the cutoff amplitude, it would play it at 70% of its original volume. And if it's below the cutoff amplitude, it would play it at 30% of its original volume. So then what that means is if you put this at 100%, then you're only gonna get the frequencies that are above this amplitude. Similarly, if you put it to all zero, then you're only gonna get the frequencies below the amplitude. As far as this, like enable tilt is, should be pretty obvious what it does. It enables this gate tilt slider here. And the gate tilt is just like how biased the cutoff amplitude is towards either the high frequencies or the low frequencies, but we're not going to use this either. And then this FFT size, I'm going to talk about in a bit. But basically what this means is that here we can get only the resonances, only the strong frequencies as they're called here. And here we can get only the atonal stuff. At least that's the hope. That's the goal. Um, this plugin calls it the weak signal and the strong signal. I'm going to call it atonal and tonal since that's mainly what I'm aiming for here. And this is how we're going to try and split the tonal signal so that we can feed the stretching algorithm a simpler signal and hopefully get better results. And then the atonal, you know, the noise, the transients that we can keep on resample and preserve the quality. So over here, I went ahead and made some demo tracks. I made these myself just to kind of get different styles, different tastes, and see how this method reacts to different types of tracks. So here's the first one. I'll just play it really quickly so we can have a bit of a reference here. So this would kind of be like the worst case situation for normal stretching because here we've got a very heavy track uh, with very little kind of musical information. Everything's playing one note. Really the main thing that's giving us the key information is the sub, though there are probably some harmonics leaking through in the basses that we'd of course want to take care of. So I'm just going to go over the process and then I'm going to show you some sound demos. So you start with the track that you want to stretch. 
send it to this mixer track. Um, this is kind of important. Spectral gate uh, adds a bit of gain when you sum it back together. And probably the reason for this is because if you're only getting one signal or the other, if they didn't add the gain, it would be way quieter and you'd have to add it yourself. But since we're combining both of them, we want it to be equal gain. So to compensate for that, usually I would say put this from anywhere between 0.6 to 0.63, and that will compensate for it. You can also just turn it down afterwards, but then you're going to be turning down two clips instead of just one. So I'm going to turn it down before. So let's go ahead and let's grab this spectral gate. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm just going to set this to be fully weak, fully atonal is the goal. And I'm just going to mess with the cutoff amplitude until I don't hear any tonal information anymore. I think this is a pretty good spot to leave it. So then we're going to want to render this out. You, of course, can click export uh, like the normal file if you want to. But what is probably much easier, especially in a mixed situation, is just right click, click Consolidate Tracks, and then from Track Start. And if you want to use the keyboard shortcuts, you can just right click and then click O, F, and then Enter. Check it out. So in a second, you've got that separation. Now let's go ahead and get the tonal stem. Keep the cutoff amplitude at the same spot. That's very important if you want it to sum to the original. And then set the weak strong balance to max so we only get the tonal strong frequencies. And again, consolidate. And now what I'm going to go ahead and do is really quickly just check the levels, make sure that everything is sounding even. And yet, yeah, this is just a little bit above zero. And let's make sure it matches up with the original track. And then I'm just going to clip the output so that we don't get any shenanigans from FL's limiter. And what you might notice if you're listening intently here is that we're actually getting a little bit of pre-ringing in this uh, spectral signal. Whereas here, we get none. And I, you know, I made this track, at least the first half, really empty and have those gaps for, for that reason, not, not just because I was lazy. Because this is the perfect time to talk about what's up with these different fast Fourier transform sizes. So let's go ahead and talk about that really quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and set this back to the spectral gate. And let's try lowering and raising this size. So first I'm going to lower it to 512 and then just repeat the process. And one more time I'm going to do this at a higher FFT size now to compare. Let's do 16K. So probably the first thing that you guys should immediately be noticing is that this adds a lot of latency. That's not the video, that's what's actually happening in my DAW right now, which is why it's such an important thing to consolidate these tracks right away, because otherwise the latency would make it unusable. By the way, the spectral gate will still cause latency even if it's not doing anything, but as soon as you consolidate it, you can just delete the spectral gate instance, because um, you won't need it anymore. I just have it open because I'm going to use it on the other demo tracks in a bit. Now, what I want you guys to immediately notice with this is the pre-ringing. I'm not going to lie, the little fade into the snare sounds cool, but that's not how it's supposed to sound. And what doesn't sound as cool is all of this noise that we get in the little gaps here. And then here is the 512. You'll notice very clean 
very, very little pre-ringing. In fact, basically none with the um, 512 here. But another thing you might notice is, take a look at, and let me just order this in order of um, FFT size, 512 up here, 2048 here, and 16K down here. If we take a look at this atonal stem, let's compare these. Something that's pretty unfortunate is that the higher the FFT size we go, the better that the plugin gets at putting the transient information in the atonal stem. So theoretically, if it wasn't for all of this noise, this would easily be the best option because when we go ahead and stretch it, the drums would still be hitting as hard as they do in the original song with those transients. But this is essentially unusable because of that noise. And I really, really did not want to have this problem. I really wanted to find a fix to this. So much so that I actually contacted Andrew Riemann, the guy that made these plugins, and asked him about it. Essentially what it came down to, or at least his theory, is that there's probably some gate logic that's missing in the plugin that would allow it to filter out that noise and avoid that kind of pre-ringing. And he mentioned that other frequency gate plugins might not have this problem. But I didn't want to use another one because it's very important to me that this one's free. I want this to be a free method because otherwise, I mean, what's the point, right? Like it might be good for some people who are willing to pay to do more stretching, but at that point I feel like it's not even worth it. So I'm still sticking with this one, but that comes with the additional warning or caution that I want to give you, which is don't go so high in FFT size. For my tests, I would say the highest you can push it to is 4K. In some cases, you can go up to 4K. But in this case, you can even notice in the 2K, we still get a bit of pre-ringing. But obviously, compared to the 16K, it's almost like nothing. So you really just have to have a bit of a trade-off, unfortunately, between how well you want the transients to be preserved and how much ringing you're willing to handle. And normally, I don't actually go above 2K, normally I stay with the uh, 2K mark, which is the default when you open the plugin. And I would say normally that's about the best balance that you get between transient preservation and noise, basically. But in this case, even at 2K, the ringing is still a little bit obvious if you're listening closely, just because of the fact that I put those empty gaps in this track. However, in most tracks, as well as the other demo tracks that I'm going to use, it won't be as obvious. So just for the sake of consistency, I'm going to go ahead and use the 2K here. But of course, you're going to want to watch out for the pre-ringing if it ever does come up, and maybe in that case, lower your FFT size. So now let's go ahead and actually start doing some stretching comparisons. First of all, something I want to make really clear, I'm going to stretch these way too far. I'm going to go pretty extreme with the stretching here so that the differences between the two are really obvious. I'm not saying that you can <laughs> stretch things this far with spectral stretching. Uh, you can definitely stretch things further in some cases than you would be able to with normal stretching, but I'm definitely overdoing it. So just keep that in mind as a little disclaimer. First thing I'm going to do is try pitching it up. I'm going to pitch this up 11 semitones on Stretch Pro. This is just going to be my little reference, my control. The reason why I'm doing 11, by the way, instead of an octave is because I want it to be really obvious if there is any tonal stuff in the atonal stem because we'll instantly notice that it's out of key. Then what we're going to want to do for the track we stemmed out is we're going to want to keep the atonal stem on resample, but then we can stretch the tonal stem. Now I'm stretching these both with Stretch Pro. You can use whatever stretching algorithm you'd like on the tonal stem. It really doesn't matter, just whatever gives you the best results. But it is important to me that I do the same one for both of these so that the comparison is fair. So here's how it sounds like if we just stretch the entire track. And here's how it sounds like if we use the spectral stretching. Bye. <laughs> 
Something that I really want you guys to notice is take a listen to the percussion in the second half. Here's with normal stretching. <laughs> And here's with the spectral stretching. It's almost as if we had separated the track using something like MVSEP and then just kept the drums on resample. This has essentially separated out the rides and hats for us and kept those on resample when we stretched the rest of the track. Whereas, of course, here you get hats that are at loony levels of, of being high pitched. Now, of course, though, things that the Stretch Pro definitely wins on here is the pre ringing, of course, is being a bit of a, uh, of a problem in this track, and we don't have that in the stretch. But also, notice the difference between the grit of the bass. This definitely sounds like more cohesive, more glued together. But here we can still keep the low grittiness from the original despite changing the key and pitching it up. So depending on the specifics of what you're looking for, one or the other might be better for you. Of course, for the pre-ringing, you could just, you know, cut out these parts to get rid of it. But it's not always going to be that simple. And of course, that's a lot of work that is already on top of all the extra work you already have to do. So in some cases, you might prefer the normal stretching, but I would say on the whole, aside from the pre-ringing, of course, I prefer the spectral, especially in the second half. Okay, but how about pitching it down? Let's try pitching it down this time. I'm only going to pitch it down minus eight so that the sub doesn't completely go to the depths of the earth. But uh, I would still say that that's probably extreme enough for us to hear the difference. So let's go ahead and compare these. Here's how it sounds like minus eight just with regular Stretch Pro. And then with the spectral stretching. So again, notice you get a lot of the highs and the percussion preserved with the spectral stretching. Though, of course, the drums get really messed up because of the, uh, the pre-ringing that's happening. And of course, if we could use a higher uh, FFT size, the transients would be preserved much more nicely. But unfortunately, that's not possible with this specific plugin. So it definitely depends on what you're looking for here. If you really want to keep the high end, then the spectral stretching is probably more for you. But maybe it sounds a bit too buzzy or out of place uh, compared to the regular stretching. And I'm going to talk a little bit more on ways to deal with that in the other two demo tracks, but I'll just leave it at that for now. And then finally, let's take a look at time stretching since we only focused on pitch shifting so far. I'm going to keep these at their normal pitch. and in order to make the resample stem still stay in sync when I time stretch it, what you're going to want to do is still keep it on resample, but on the time knob, right click and click project tempo. Now, when I change the tempo, instead of desyncing, it'll still stay in sync, but it's going to stay on resample. So it'll pitch up if I speed up the project file and it'll pitch down if I slow down the project file. All right. So let's compare again. Let's go pretty extreme with this. Let's speed it up to 190. Here's how it sounds on the normal demo track. And here's how it sounds like with spectral stretching. For this one, 
I'll be the first to admit that I'm not loving the spectral stretching for this track, speeding it up. You definitely lose a lot of the power and a lot of the punchiness from the original uh, that gets even better maintained uh, with just normal Stretch Pro. So for this one, I would absolutely not use the spectral stretching. Let's try slowing it down. Maybe go down to 110. And here's the spectral stretching. So in this case, because we're slowing it down, the atonal stem is actually being pitched down, so we're actually losing high end in this case for the spectral stretching version. But one thing I do want you guys to notice is, remember what I said earlier about the double kicks? Well, that shows up in the regular stretch here. Unfortunately, I can't just play this part because when I play it, fun fact about stretching if you didn't know, it's actually inconsistent. Depending on where you start playing the track, the track will be stretched differently each time you play it. So if I play this, no double kick if I play this, there's a little bit of one, but if I play it all the way from the beginning, there's a huge double kick in there. So let me actually consolidate this really quick so that I can actually play it reliably and consistently. But that's something that I didn't mention in my uh, stretching video from last year, mostly because I didn't even know it back then. But that's something very important to keep in mind when you're stretching things is that depending on where you play it, it might not sound the same as how it does in the exported version. So that's something very important to notice. But anyways, here you can clearly see the double kick, right? We get two transients there. Let me go ahead and export the spectral stretching one though. And if we go ahead to that one spot where we had the double kick here, listen. There's no double kick. The kick is definitely not high quality, don't get me wrong, but there's no double kick. Whereas here, there certainly is a double kick. So that's something very important and very interesting to keep in mind with this stuff is that the spectral stretching, it's gonna get rid of the double kicks, uh, at least, if you're able to get those transients onto the resample stem. Whereas here, again, it can be very inconsistent. You can get those double kicks, disappearing kicks, whatnot. So if you really care about the drums, then you might go with this one, but I've already talked about in previous videos, ways to add in your own drums so that you don't even need to use the drums from the stretch track. But if you care about more so the bass and whatnot, you're probably thinking that the stretching one sounds better. And I think I would agree. All right, so those are all the tests that I wanted to do for demo track one. Let's go ahead and get the second demo track and do the same tests. So the first demo track was again, supposed to be kind of like the worst case scenario for stretching since it's a heavy track, not a lot of melodic information. But what about the opposite? What about the worst case scenario for the spectral stretch? Because this is also gonna be very high energy, but it's gonna be melodic. So here, we're not going to be able to be as forgiving with our atonal stem because there's a much higher chance of getting some melodic tonal information in there. But first of all, let me just play how this track sounds normally for reference. Again, made by me. It's also a lot busier than the first demo track, so that's something to keep in mind as well that may or may not affect the results we get. But anyways, of course, let's pull up the spectral gate. Remember to turn down the volume to compensate for the gain. I'll also turn off the wave shaper really quick so that we can do a volume comparison afterwards. And then 
turn it fully weak, try and get as much of the atonal stem in there as we can, but also only atonal stuff in there. Like right off the bat, with the settings that we had from the previous track, we can see that they're not going to fly, because on these uh, little snare stops here, you can definitely hear the lead bleeding through there, so we're going to need to be a bit more aggressive. So here would be, uh, I think, probably the highest I can go, and you still can hear a little bit of the tonality in there. And normally in these cases, I'd advise you to lower the cutoff amplitude even more just to be absolutely sure that there's nothing out of key when you actually do the stretching. But I'm not going to do that in this video just because if I lower it anymore, then it'll start to be pretty hard to hear the difference between normal stretching and spectral stretching. So let's just go ahead and export it as is. And as you can see, this is a much quieter uh, consolidated track than the previous one. We do have a little bit of the transient information there, but not a whole lot. And then let's go ahead and render the tonal stem. All right. Once again, let's make sure that our levels are looking pretty reasonable. And I would say this is even better than the previous case, actually. We're barely peaking above zero. And notice how in this case, unlike in the previous demo track, the pre-ringing is not noticeable. At least I'm not hearing any difference between these two. So like I mentioned, you're usually going to be able to get away with a 2K FFT size. It's just in cases like these where you have maybe empty parts where you might want to lower it even further. Now, again, let's go ahead and compare. I'm going to do the exact same comparisons as last time. I'm just going to, first of all, try pitching it up 11. Here's how it sounds with just the demo track. And then here's how it sounds on the spectral stretching. They sound very similar to me, which makes sense since like 90% of our track is being stretched anyway, and we only have a little bit on resample. So yeah, in this case, not really a big enough difference for me, even when pitching it up so extremely. So let's just move on and let's try pitching it down. So let's pitch this down minus eight. And here's how it sounds on just normal stretching. And here's the spectral stretching. So we definitely keep that high end, but to me at least, it's pretty buzzy and it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. But there's a way to fix this actually, and this is what I was alluding to earlier. I'm going to go ahead and do this now. If we take this atonal stem and link it, how about to track two here? We can insert a frequency shifter. There's a stock one in FL Studio now that I can use, but Kilohertz also has a free one. Andrew Riemann, the guy who made the Spectral Gate plugin, also has a free frequency shifter with a customizable FFT size, so that's very neat. Melda Productions have a free frequency shifter plugin. So you've got a lot of options, and you can just mess around with the different plugins and see which one works the best. And really quickly, let me explain why this works for spectral stretching specifically, but not for anything else. And if you're not really interested in the explanation, again, there's timestamps in the description, so you can just skip ahead. But basically, to explain what a frequency shifter does, if you're unfamiliar, let me just go ahead and pull up like a triangle wave. So if I go ahead and play A here, that is indeed 440 hertz. If I play A an octave lower here, that's 220 hertz. 
every octave, you double the frequency. So 220, 440. If I go up one higher, that'll be 880. So what's the point? Well, notice that the distance between these two notes and these two notes, both of those are an octave. They're the same distance apart pitch wise, but frequency wise, these have a distance of 220 Hertz. Whereas these have a distance of 440 Hertz. So even though pitch wise, they sound like the same distance to us, frequency wise, it's doubled. So then you might ask, well, what would it sound like if we did have the same distance between those two? And we can see that pretty easily with phase plan here. I can set the harmonic to zero and set this to be 220 hertz. And sure enough. And it also tells me that M analyzer is a little bit inaccurate since I set this to exactly 220, but insists that it's 219.9. So take this with a grain of salt. But anyways, 440, that will give us A. And then if we go up another 220, that will land us at 660. These two notes sound closer together than these two. So what a frequency shifter does is it'll shift each frequency the same amount. So if I played two notes that were an octave apart, when I shift them, one of them might go from 220 to 440 up an octave, but the other one will go from 440 to 660 up less than an octave. So whenever you put this on anything tonal, it'll completely mess up all the pitch relationships in the signal, which can sound great for creative purposes, but for pitch shifting, it's not at all going to work. But we can do it here because we've specifically created a stem here that has no tonal information. So what that means is that we can change the frequency to our liking. And by the way, the frequency shifter does not use the same granular resynthesis technology that gives us the infamous stretching artifacts. So we can shift it without those artifacts and also without wrecking the entire tonality of the sound because there is no tonality to be wrecked here. So all that's to say is I'm going to shift this down a little bit, mess with the settings. This I'm going to give myself 20 kilohertz of room here. I might mess with the shifter versus the HQ, see what I like better. And we're just going to be able to dial in the amount that we want so that we don't get that buzzy uh, high end that again sticks out like a sore thumb. So notice that we're still able to get more high end than the normal stretching. But it's not abrasive or obnoxious like this. And now if you're really listening intently, you'll notice that there's a little bit of the notes bleeding through on the atonal stem. which you'd of course want to avoid. But that's obviously a simple fix of just going back and adjusting the threshold of the spectral gate to remove that. So for this, I would definitely say spectral gate takes the cake because we're able to dial in the exact tonality of it, keep as much of the high end or as little of the high end as we want and end up getting a much brighter but still not abrasive result when compared to the original stretching. So that's pitching it down. Let's get rid of the repitching and let's speed it up. Now, before I speed it up, of course, we have to go into resample, set this to project tempo so that it doesn't desync. And I'll speed it up about 40 BPM. We can go 180. So that's, of course, regular stretching and then spectral stretching.
Again, the high end feels kind of out of control, but we can fix it using the exact same technique. So let's just shift this until we find the sweet spot. Yeah, the, uh, the normal stretching definitely sounds crunchier either way. So even though we were able to dial this one in, I would actually prefer the regular stretching in this case for speeding it up. But you know, maybe you can dial in settings that work even better for you. Finally, let's slow it down and compare. Again, we'll go minus 40-ish. Let's go to 100 BPM. Here's how it sounds like with regular stretching. and then spectral stretching. So obviously you lose a lot of that high end. And again, you might want to run it through the frequency shifter, shifting it up this time and try and see if you can compensate for that. So this one's another one where it's up to you. I feel like the spectral stretching feels a little bit less abrasive, but it also feels a little bit weaker. So depending on what you're looking for, you might go one or the other. That's all the tests for Demo Track 2. So now let's go ahead and load up Demo Track 3. I already showed you guys, you know, a high energy aggressive track. Then I showed you a high energy melodic track. So of course, to even things out, Let's do a chill track, right? Let's change, do a little change of pace and see how the spectral stretching reacts to this. So again, this is just by me. I'll play through the original for reference. And now let's go ahead and do our normal stretching routine. So again, turn it down to compensate for the increase in gain, send it to the spectral gate, fully weak, and let's dial this in. So right off the bat, I can tell you that we're gonna need to be even more aggressive with our atonal stem for this one than for either of the previous ones because at this setting that we had it for the previous track, we're already still getting some tonal information in this stem. So let's be more aggressive until we get rid of that. There's a little bit still in there. We'll see if that comes up as a problem or not. Um, but for now, let's just consolidate that. As you can see, very little in our atonal stem. Now let's get the tonal stem. And now let's consolidate this as well. All right, let's do a real quick gain check. I'll disable the wave shaper real quick. And this one, we're pretty much spot on. If anything, we might actually be even a little bit quieter than the original. So let's compare. I think it's close enough though. I'll add this on though, because I know we're gonna get some gain as soon as we start stretching. And let's go ahead and start our comparisons. So first off, of course, pitching it up 11 semitones. Let's see what we get. So that's just normal stretching, your spectral stretching. And really pay attention to the difference in the in the hats here. Even though obviously the synths and everything is sounding like a chipmunk, the hats are so well preserved in the spectral stretching one compared to the normal stretching. Yeah, for this one I would say I definitely prefer 
the spectral stretching. Now let's do minus eight. So that's, of course, regular stretching and then spectral stretching. So here, now you can really hear that uh, atonal stem sticking out like a sore thumb. Let's see if we can try and fix this with frequency shifting. Let's just pull up a frequency shifter here and mess around with the settings until we get something that we like. Yeah, unfortunately in this case, you just lose a lot of the transients when you do the spectral stretching. Like we can get the tonality to sound just fine, but then you lose some of the attack on those on those perks. So in this case, I would have to go regular stretching for the win for this one. Then let's remove this repitching and let's try speeding it up. And of course, we have to go into here and click project tempo so that it stays synced. Again, I'm going to speed it up about 40 BPM, so let's go 200. And here's how it sounds with normal stretching. And then with the spectral stretching. So again, you can really hear some of that out of key stuff creeping through. So of course, in a case like this, you'd want to go back into your spectral gate and adjust the threshold again to make sure you completely eliminate any tonal information from the atonal stem. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it as is and throw it in the frequency shifter to see what we get. The spectral stretching doesn't sound too bad, but I would definitely uh, choose the regular stretching in this case. However, something really interesting happens when we slow it down. In fact, I'm going to push it further than any of the other demo tracks just so that it's really obvious. Let's bring it all the way down to 100 BPM. Here's how it sounds on regular stretching. And then here is the spectral stretch version. So remember what happened in the first two demo tracks when we slowed it down was that the atonal stem would be pitching down because it's on resample. So we would lose energy and usually it didn't sound as good because those tracks were meant to be energetic and high end is a huge contributor to the energy. But this track isn't meant to be energetic, it's meant to be chill. So what happens is that we get the effect of it being pitched down without actually changing the key. So then what you're able to do is you're able to make a track have that slow down, pitch down effect, sound way more mellow and chill than it already is without having to change the key. And that I think is the coolest thing and probably my favorite discovery of all of my tests that I've done with this spectral stretching. So again, I'll, I'll stop talking for a second and just compare the two and listen especially to those hats and that percussion. And more importantly, not only do they sound really cool creatively because they sound you know, pitched down without actually having the track pitched down, but they also don't sound stretched because they're not on stretch. So you also keep a lot more quality that way versus the regular stretching. In fact, I would even almost go so far as to say that the track almost doesn't sound stretched at all, just, just slowed down. I think really the main things that are giving it away are like the kick and the rim. You can tell that those are stretched, but since the perks sound so clean, it gives the illusion that the track as a whole is not being stretched. 
And that's an illusion that you definitely don't get with the regular stretching. So absolutely 100% for chill music if I'm slowing it down, spectral stretching is the way to go if you ask me. It is such a cool effect that I didn't know I needed until I first heard it. So I absolutely love that and I hope you guys get a lot of mileage out of that too. Now before I go into some pros and cons and some concluding remarks, let me just show you a couple of the highlights that I found when testing this on tracks made by other people. So the first one here is on Dangerous by Televisor. One of the things that I didn't mention or use in any of my demo tracks were vocals. So you might be wondering, how does this spectral stretching respond to vocals? And here's an example where I think it works really nicely. So here I'm just doing normal minus seven stretching on Stretch Pro, and then here I have the spectral counterpart. So first of all, let me just play how it sounds like on normal stretching. Obviously not great, but let's see how it sounds like on the spectral stretching. It's a world of difference, right? Like again, like I mentioned with the chill track, sometimes the high end can get annoying and you actually want to reduce that. But here, it brings back all the life from the original unstretched version that you completely lose when you use normal stretching. And of course, the high end can get a bit annoying, a bit much, a bit abrasive. Frequency shifting could solve that. Even just EQing, you can definitely dial it in the way you like. But I'm just doing it on the default here just so you guys can hear how it sounds without any extra effects. And it really, really is like night and day. The other two examples that I wanted to show you here are both with Magma by Pixel Tear. And this is an interesting one because uh, some people might tell you that Pixel Tear is kind of like the final boss of stretching. Their, their tracks are notoriously incompatible with stretching. Even just a little bit of stretching can ruin the entire mix because of the way that they mix their tracks. So I definitely wanted to see if spectral stretching can solve this problem and let me just show you how it sounds pitched up and pitched down. So first off, again, I've got it pitched up 11 semitones, just like in the examples from earlier. And here's how it sounds like with normal stretching. Notice you're getting a lot of double kicks, even some double snares in there. It's not good. But let's hear with the spectral stretching. Not only are you not getting those double kicks and snares anymore, but also that bass from the original, you can still have it be playing out in the bass region, kind of like how it was with the demo track, but I feel like it works even better here than it did with the demo track since there's not as much pre-ringing. So this is one that I would say is a massive improvement on normal stretching. How about when we pitch it down? I'll go minus four, not as extreme as in the, uh, the demo tracks, but I think that this will still be a pretty obvious difference. Here's how it sounds like with normal stretching. Obviously, it completely ruins the whole mix, but let's see how spectral stretching did. The high end can feel a little bit tinny, but at least you have the high end, which is impossible no matter what you do for for the original stretching. Obviously, you could boost the high end with an EQ, but you're not going to preserve it. Sweat. 
So these are a few cases where I think spectral stretching performed the best. And before you get, you know, upset or, or angry that I'm just kind of like picking out my favorite examples and not showing all of the examples where it might not have worked as well. The thing is, here's what I really want to make clear with this video. I don't want it to seem like I'm trying to claim that spectral stretching should replace existing algorithms or that it's always better or anything. What I am trying to say though, is that it certainly sometimes sounds better. And sometimes it even sounds way better. But really what this is meant to be is for me to show you, hey, this is a trick that you can have in your toolkit that most people aren't gonna have. And in some cases, it can make a world of difference for when most people are only gonna be able to do this. But you can do this. And obviously, of, of course, like I mentioned earlier, you don't want to pitch something up <laughs> 11 semitones, especially not a pixel terror track. But if we take a look at the difference in quality, this is a difference that you're going to be able to have now that you know about the spectral stretching method that people who haven't seen this video aren't going to know about. That's what I'm trying to say here is that you're not going to always use it, but it's there when you need it. And it lets you do things that you would not have been able to do before with regular stretching. So I want to look at some pros and cons between spectral stretching and regular stretching to help you get an idea of when to use each one. One thing that I do want to mention really quickly, though, that I haven't mentioned yet in this video and that I would certainly be remiss if I didn't mention at all in this video is that what I said from the video from last year uh, about the stretching techniques certainly still stands. Resample is going to be the highest quality always. So if you can keep things on resample, I would absolutely have you do that before doing either of these methods. The point of stretching is for times when you want to pitch or time tracks in a way that resample just can't do anymore. Otherwise, I would certainly still say to stick to resample. Anyways, let's start with the pros of spectral stretching. For one, we definitely heard that it can sound a lot better in a lot of cases. Second of all, you get a lot more control since you're able to dictate, you know, the timbre of the atonal stem as well as how much or how little of the track you want to keep on resample. However, that can be a con as well. So let's, let's actually go into the cons right now. The first con would for sure be the fact that it's a workflow killer. I mean, if you thought waiting for the pre-computed stretch algorithms to load was bad, you definitely would not be ready for this. Not only does it take longer to set up, but it's also more annoying to work with after you set it up because now you have to deal with two clips instead of just one. So that means every fade, cut, shift, all of that, you'd have to apply to two clips instead of just one. You can group clips in FL, by the way, so that they're kind of linked. But even then, it's still an extra hassle that can be a huge stunt to your workflow if you're used to just stretching and it's instantly there. Now you have to have all of these extra steps that go in just to stretch a track. Another con for spectral stretching is that it's more risky than regular stretching. Now, the reason why I put risky in quotes is because I feel like a lot of this is more of a psychological risk than an actual risk. By that, I mean that we're used to normal stretching artifacts. We've had stretch modes for years, right? Complex, Complex Pro have been around for years. Stretch Pro has even been around for not a small amount of time now. So even if the stretching sounds bad, it won't sound out of place since that's what we're used to. In fact, I'd even argue to an extent that our brain kind of filters out a little bit of the artifacts after a while just because we get so used to them. So with the spectral stretching, even if the artifacts aren't as bad, they could still be more of a problem than normal stretching just because they sound out of place to us since we're not used to them. So that's, of course, something that you're going to want to keep in mind when using spectral stretching. But my hope would be that if this, if this catches on and more and more people use it, that will become less and less of a problem. The other con, though, is that it's more risky. <laughs> this time, I didn't put quotes because this is an actual risk. Like I mentioned, with more control, that can actually be a greater risk, a greater chance to mess up. I would say one of the worst ways that you could mess up, which in all fairness, I did do a little bit of this in the video, is if you let too much tonal information go into the tonal stem. Because once you do that, then when you try and repitch or retime the track, then that tonal information is going to be out of key because you left it on resample. So that's something where you need to be very careful 
when setting your cutoff. And you would definitely want to have too little atonal information in that stem rather than too much and letting some of the tonal stuff bleed through. I didn't really do that much for this video just because the more aggressive you get with it, the more similar it sounds to normal stretching. And the whole point of this video is to highlight the differences between the two. But I absolutely want to urge that for you guys when you go ahead and do this method. Make sure you do not let tonal information get into your atonal stem. Beyond that, there are some other risks as well. Like, for example, the frequency shifting can introduce some risks. Depending on the plugin and settings you use, you can get some ringing if you push it too hard. So you definitely want to watch out for that. Not to mention the risk that we saw at the very beginning of the video is the pre-ringing or the noise. If you set your FFT size to an improper value, you can get some of that noise introduced as well, which can also completely kill the track too. So there are a lot of actual risks here on top of the perceived ones that I mentioned earlier. So I would definitely say that I wouldn't recommend this method to people who are just trying to get into mixing and mashing, because you definitely need to have a bit of an ear to catch the potential problems with the stretching. And I would want people who are trying to learn mixing and mashing to focus on more important skills. But that said, I would definitely recommend this to people who are already comfortable with mixing and mashing, because you guys, you can watch out for the risks, right? Now that I'm telling you they're there, you know what to look out for, and you can perfectly avoid them, no problem. In fact, I think that for a lot of you, this could be the perfect next step to exploring something new and, and going even further with your mixing and mashing in ways that you weren't able to before. Not to mention, there are also some sick creative possibilities for production that I didn't even touch on. You know, you could try doing the opposite of what I did and put the noise on stretch and the tonal stuff on resample. Maybe you could do some pitch automation and have a sound change pitch, but the timbre of the noise stay the same. Like for creative purposes, there are a lot of possibilities with this that you can explore now. Speaking of things that I didn't touch on though, I want to mention some other limitations of the video and interesting things that I just couldn't include for the sake of not making this video even longer than it already is. First of all, I didn't show you any examples where you were simultaneously pitch shifting and time stretching. That said, these sound about the same as what you'd expect, but it would certainly be something worth trying on your own. Second, I use Stretch Pro as both the reference and for stretching the tonal stem. But if you use some of the other stretch modes or if you're in Ableton using the Ableton warp modes, you can get very different results. So if you guys try those out and find something cool or interesting or a stretch mode that works really well for a certain style of track, please let me know. Another thing that I didn't even mention is how spectral stretching works on, say, intros versus outros of tracks and variable cutoff amplitudes. Because since drops are much louder, you might be able to have a more aggressive cutoff amplitude in those cases. But then that same cutoff amplitude might have tonal audio leaking in in the quieter parts of the track. So you might have to have different cutoff amplitudes for different sections of the track to tailor it to the loudness of that track. Another limitation is that I didn't even bring up how these sounded when doing tempo automation. The reason for that not to mention, of course, the length of the video, but also because it's very case by case. Normal resample, as I think I mentioned in the past, will always not work with tempo automation because either it's going to get desynced or you're going to get unwanted pitch slides, so it's going to go out of key. But you're not going to have that problem with spectral stretching because you're stretching the tonal stem. That said, though, it could still not work, especially with like extreme tempo automations, because the atonal stem is still going to be pitching up or down. So while that's not going to go out of key, you're still going to hear a difference in the, in the timbre. So if it's too noticeable, then it can be distracting and just not sound good. So it really depends heavily on the track, how much atonal information is in there in the stem, as well as how extreme the tempo automation is. So it's really not something that I could say it's always going to work or it's never going to work. It, it really just depends. So that's, again, another thing that I would certainly encourage you guys to mess with on your own. Another thing that I didn't talk about is, of course, the spectral weighting that I mentioned earlier in the video. For that, you could use something like MBSEP to split the track into the acapella and instrumental stem, and then use format preserving stretching on the vocal but not on the instrumental. You can get some really interesting results with that. Maybe it sounds really sick and really clean. Maybe it sounds terrible. I guess the only way to find out is to try it. On the topic of MBSEP, you could even go as far as to stem separate the track into all of the stems 
and then spectral stretch each individual stem so that you can cater the gate to the best settings possible. That way you can get like the ultimate stretching scenario, but obviously it would take a ton of work. You would have like 10 clips at the end of it. So it can get really crazy really quickly. I guess it kind of just depends on how badly you want to stretch a track and have a good quality out of it. Another limitation of the video is that I only used this specific plugin, the spectral gate, but there are other plugins that will do the same thing with some variations. Like I mentioned, it's super important to me that this one is free, but if you're willing to spend the money, you might be able to find one that does a better job maybe of preserving the transients without the noise and the pre-ringing. So depending on how far you want to go in that direction as well, you might be able to get even crazier results there too. And I didn't even mention plugins like Eventide Split EQ and Fission MK2 that use AI to separate audio into transient and tonal stems instead of you know spectral analysis like the spectral gate. Part of the reason why I didn't include them is those plugins aren't free and I can't really do a replication with MVSEP because that separates it into instruments. It doesn't separate into transient and tonal. But if you own one of those plugins or if you are looking into getting one of those plugins, that's a whole nother avenue that you can explore and get completely different results there too. Also, something that I want to get out of the way in this video that some of you guys might have been thinking is you might have asked, what's the point of this? Why don't you just split something with MVSEP and just keep the drums on resample, for instance, because in some of the demo tracks, that's what it sounded like I was doing. It just sounded like I was preserving the drums and a bit of the noise, and it seemed like there wasn't really any advantage to this spectral stretching method over just using MVSEP and keeping some of the stems on resample. But the difference, and one of the crucial things to notice is, even drums have tonal elements to them. You know, especially in drum and bass, sometimes in dubstep, you can have a really strong tonal fundamental for a snare, for instance. So then if you keep that on resample and you repitch it, retime it, whatever, it will be out of key. So that's why just splitting it with MVSEP isn't enough and it's not going to work. Spectral gate, if you set the cutoff amplitude right, ensures that there is nothing that will be out of key when you actually go ahead and stretch or retime the track. Whereas if you were to do it with MVSEP like you might have before, that is not at all a guarantee. So basically the point is, there's a ton to explore here. This video really only scratches the surface. Mostly what I wanted to do was just introduce this new method, give you guys the reasons, the justification behind it, the thinking, show you how to do it, give you some examples, and then you guys might be the ones that can take it to the next level. I'll leave the video with that for now. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this useful and interesting, and I'm really excited to see what you guys come up with using this method. If you want to talk more with me, you can join my Discord server. The link is in the description. Also, if you missed it, I recently made a mix as a takeover for IMG's Polaroids 150 special. And yes, I did do some spectral stretching in there. I'll link that one in the description too, so you guys can check it out if you haven't already. I think that's about all I've got though. Thanks again for watching. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.